أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of God the beneficent, the merciful and I send peace and greetings to all of you my respected Shia Sharaf, Reverend Lindsay and all of you my respected brothers and sisters uh, and humanity and Islam Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, which is the final revelation given unto mankind, as we know God has sent us on this earth to recognize His infinite mercy, and He has endowed us with intelligence, and He has given us the ability to recognize what is true and what is false, because there is a natural ethos when it comes to promoting the good and demoting evil, and there's a natural system in the world that a person who lies cannot sustain the lies for long. So the Quran says, قُلْ جَعَ الْحَقِّ وَزَحْقَ الْبَاطِلِ That indeed truth is ever prevalent and lies are ever falling. And our intelligence therefore is given this ability to engage in this reality that we exist in, to accept and to submit to the infinite mercy of God who has given us this opportunity within this short span of time on this earth to promote that which is good and to demote that which is evil. So God has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed many scriptures upon mankind. As we know, Adam is our first prophet and of course the last messenger among all these 124,000 prophets that were revealed unto mankind is none other than the Holy Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So it is important for at least as a Muslim to understand that Islam did not start 14 centuries ago. It was completed 14 centuries ago. Meaning the religion of God became complete 14 centuries ago. Meaning the moral prescription given unto mankind was completed 14 centuries ago. And God in the Holy Quran tells us in various ways about our objectives in this world and puts into perspective what happened in the past, how to manage the present, and how to prepare for the future. So for example, the Quran has laid some basic foundations that all of humanity has to follow. The reason I say has to follow, it's not because they necessarily have to read the Quran to follow, but the natural system of the universe compels all of us to follow it and therefore the Quran exposes that. For example, in Surah Al-Asr, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr, inna al-insana lafi khus, illa al-ladina amanu wa amilu al-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqti wa tawasaw bil-sabat. Here Allah SWT makes a very interesting, it's a whole chapter in the Qur'an where God swears by time. He says, well, Asr, indeed mankind is at a loss. In other words, the verse is beginning with a threat. This is a universal principle in the Qur'an that mankind is at a, at a loss. By time, mankind is at a loss. In al insana lafi khusr. Except those who believe and do good deeds and they promote justice, truth, and equity, and they enjoin on each other patience. Patience because this is a world of trials and tribulations. It is a world where one has to be patient to understand the wisdom of God having created us on this transient earth to fulfill the major objective which is to be submissive. So that's the principle. This is Islam. Islam as we know is a religion. It's the only religion in the world named after a verb and a noun which root, the root word is Salama which means peace, submission. Now with respect to all the religions and they all have very positive attributes Christians, Jews, Hindus, but they're all named after a person. Islam is named after a verb and an action because God named it clearly in the Quran. 
when the Holy Prophet completed his mission in appointing his successor, he says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورديت لكم الإسلام دينا Today we have completed our favor upon you. Completed. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم أكملت we completed. What is the completion? The message started with Adam, peace be upon him. And then as we know as the patriarchal prophet Abraham, as hence the Judeo-Christian Islamic religions are known as the Abrahamic faith, because we all share the same prophet, Abraham, the patriarch of prophets. You find that Abraham was a great prophet, and the Quran describes his greatness in, the, in, in his life. We find he had two children, Ismail and Ishaq, Ishmael and Isaac. And from both, there is this blessed tree, a blessed tree of prophets that came, including the major ones, of course, as we know, Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, peace be upon him. What a great personality that walked this earth. And as I resonate with my respected Reverend Lindsay, when she speaks about Jesus alayhi salam, peace be upon him, you feel that presence of a prophet. Of course, our Christian brethren take it a little bit differently, but the principle is the same. When I read the Bible and I read the words of Jesus, peace be upon him, I resonate. Even the Messenger of Allah has said, you want to follow Jesus, follow him. You want to follow Moses, follow him. They are all prophets of Allah. They are all one and the same in the message. They deliver the same message, which is oneness of God, promotion of God, in the dimension of God. So Islam, the name, Al-Islam, God named it. It says, today we completed this favor upon you and perfected this religion for you called Al-Islam, which is a gift upon you. Ni'ma, wa raditu islam deena. And we are pleased with this religion called Al-Islam. So as a Muslim, I'd like to explain, because today in the geopolitical world, Islam is the most marginalized religion in the world. And as was my respected Sheikh Sharaf mentioned, how great this Prophet was. His qualities are supreme to no other human being that can come equal to him in his status. Indeed, he is the best role model. And his family follows right after him because that is what Allah has commanded us to follow. But we find the Messenger of Allah is central, he is axial. And his quality was so supreme, even people like Michael H. Hart, who's written the hundred most influential people in the history of the human race, even in his second edition, insists that no man has affected the quality of the human race at all levels, including their moral levels, other than Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa When the Orientalists speak as such, that how great a man he was, he never harmed anyone, a man of peace. Even when he conquered Mecca, the conquering of Mecca was not because it was not his land. That house, the Kaaba, was built by the command of God, by the predecessors of this Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by his grandfather Ismail, Ismail as we call him. That God sent him and his mother to this valley of Baqa to build this house. In fact, the Quran states that the first house of God on earth is the Kaaba. In the awwal bayt in wudi al nas, the ladi bi Bakkata mubaraka wa hudalil alamin. Indeed, the first house of God is the Kaaba. It was built by the command of God. It was usurped, and idols were placed into it, 360 plus idols were placed into it, in order to confuse mankind away from the path of God. Among mankind there are those who create frivolous talk to take mankind away from the path of God. Those idols were this frivolous notion, and you find all prophets in the Judeo-Christian traditions too, we find even Jesus, peace be upon him, says, Hear ye, Israel, your Lord is one. 
And that is the fundamental axis of the religion of God, that we all have to submit to one God. Why? If an atheist asks me that question, why do you need to believe in one God? Why do you need to believe in God? I don't believe in God. I go outside and I get the same suntan you do. When I get sick, I go to the doctor and get myself fixed just like you do. I die just like you die. You feel the pain just like I feel the pain. What's the difference? The difference is I have made myself one more, one less God, and I have therefore removed the complication in my life. <laughs> but I always ask them, that's a mechanical statement you're making. All the statements you've made are mechanical. God is merciful. He gives equal to all. The question is, where do you derive your morality from? Because ultimately, we don't want to claim to be the best mechanics on earth. We want to be the most moral people on earth. Hence, when the Prophet said, Indeed, I have been sent to perfect your moral traits. It's precisely that the operative word is the moral principles of humanity that elevates the status of humanity. For I can be the world's best mechanic in anything, and I can have knowledge of all scientific methodologies, but if my moral character is out of place, and I am rude, or reckless, or stingy, or condescending in any negative attribute, then the individuals will say, you are not worthy of what you possess. So therefore, a person could be completely penniless, but if their moral standards are good, they are broad-minded, they are giving and forgiving, and they hold back their anger, such is a superior person. And Allah says, who are they? الَّذِينَ يُتْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّةِ وَالْدَرَّةِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْمِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Who are these people, God says? Who are the ones that paradise awaits them? They are the ones who give charity in good times and in bad times. الَّذِينَ يُتْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّةِ وَالْدَرَّةِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْمِ They hold back their anger. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ they forgive mankind. Notice the Quran is stating they forgive mankind. It doesn't say forgive the believers. But Ahin Ali Nas, they forgive mankind. Indeed, God loves the good doers. So religion to us in the belief in God, in the unity of all those who believe in God, we should encourage each other to believe in one God because the supremacy of our morality is derived from the sublime absolute one being. That's how, that is why we all encourage each other to come towards the one God. The Quran's attitude towards the Christians and the Jews, for example, it addresses them as Ahlul Kitab, people of the book with honor. Nowhere in the Quran is Allah ever allowed a human being to adjudicate or to be judgmental even against a Hindu or an atheist, and especially among people who share the scriptures with us from the beginning, from Adam till the completion, for us to dare to be condescending against each other. Where Allah says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلْهُمْ Say, O people of the book, come, let us have an equitable discussion where we agree to worship one God. And the end of that verse, God says, if they refuse, just bear witness that you are Muslims, that you submit. Nowhere has the Quran says, if they refuse, grab them and kill them. <laughs> it doesn't say that. Nowhere in the Quran has Allah ever allowed a human being to kill an individual. Quran categorically states, لا إكراه في الدين There is no compulsion in religion. قد تبين الرشد من الغير Truth is clear from error. فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالْتَعْهُودِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْمُسْقَى Whoever rejects the demigods and submits to the one God is holding on to a rope firm and it shall not break. That's the universal principle of Islam. And I as a Muslim feel blessed to be a human being. Among a diverse community as was articulated beautifully, this is a diverse world. And the idea of creating a monolithic society is not within the design of God's creation. Single track thinking, one community thinking one way, is not the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
I always say even identical twins, they're genetically identical, they do not agree on everything. Even a child who's born of his mother, who gave her blood and flesh to this child, the child will not accept everything the mother says. No way. That's what gives us autonomy. That's what makes us different. That's what makes us beautiful. لِتَعَارَفُ is Quran says, so you can recognize this variety. So the, the key is not to make everybody follow one pathway. The key is to manage our differences. The trial on Judgment Day is not to make people follow your pathway. It is to see whether you are able to manage difference of opinion, which is the operative word called salama, which is peace. So, I always say, this world is a world where we have to agree to disagree agreeably. <laughs> That's what life is all about. Now often when we say something and someone doesn't like it or we hear somebody say this, it's like, oh my God, I can't handle this. Like when I have discussions with atheists and they say, your God is no good. I don't think I'm rich to that. So, oh my God, I have to destroy this man. How dare in the domain of God he allows such an individual to deny the existence of God? I always say to myself, God is the one who created him. He's the one who put that brain in him. He's the one who gave him that perspective, the potential of that perspective. And he has taken that perspective and God is not zapping him with a thunder lightning bolt on his head. Who am I? What's your authority? Just discuss with him because God has told me in the Quran, ادعو الى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعدة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن. Invite to the people, invite people to the way of your Lord. ادعو الى سبيل ربك بالحكمة with wisdom. Wisdom requires knowledge, requires a character, requires an etiquette, requires forbearance requires a broad vision. You cannot just say, you are a Christian, you're going to hell. You are an atheist, you're going to hell. You are of this school, you're going to hell. That's not hikmah. Hikmah is to say, what is your position? If somebody was to say, I hold this position about God, or I don't believe in God. God says, approach it with wisdom. Put yourself in that person's shoes, first of all. Don't think it's that easy to reach that position. No human being will damn and condemn themselves. We're very selfish beings for a good reason. But we want to save our souls. So when somebody is against us in our pathway, it's not because they're against our pathway, because their worldview has taken them there. We have to respect that. So Quran says, be hikmah, with wisdom. Be gentle. Don't be condescending. Do not be, uh, do not look down upon them. Do not be facetious in your methodology. Be gentle and kind and respect it. Like our Reverend, respected Reverend say, that when somebody has a difference of opinion, you say, well, here's my opinion. What do you think of this? That dialogue is what brings about equity and harmony in the world. So Allah says, بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِدَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ Use good, sound discussion. Don't step on people's toes. If a person does not believe in God, he said, I respect that. Now let me show you where you may have gone wrong. I always believe that in these discussions, never put the individual in the argument. Put the principle in the argument. Leave the individual out. Because that individual, 30 seconds before, may have rejected it. 30 seconds later, may accept it. But if you're going to damn the individual, now you have prevented them from turning the right path. Because now you've taken, you have insulted them, which we will call ad hominem. It's not a proper attitude. This is how our messenger was. When an atheist came to him and asked him, and said, I don't believe in God. So the Prophet says to him, if you don't believe in God, why don't you believe in God? He said, he said, I haven't seen him create. I didn't see him create. Look at the wisdom of the messenger of God. He said, since you did not see God create, then who created you? He says, I don't know. So the Prophet replied, if you don't know, then how do you know that God did not create you? <laughs> so the man said, I don't know. So the Prophet said, then you've taken a blind leap of faith against God. And it is wiser for you to be an agnostic than for you to take this blind leap 
to reject the existence of God. So better stay in the middle and don't cast a comment until you are certain. See, that's the wisdom of a man who engages you intellectually. No condemnation. Was this atheist condemned by the prophets? No. No, this is not the principle of Islam. So, the introduction of Islam being the religion of peace is fundamentally bound not by some adage or terminologies or titles that entitles us to promote the idea of peace. To me, Islam is a pragmatic religion, fundamentally just, fundamentally equitable. As Quran says, Maintain the scale and do not tip it. God says, God loves the peacemakers. This is the principle in the Quran. The Quran says if you kill one human being, you have killed a nation. You save one human being, you have saved a nation. None of us reject this as Muslims. So I want to pose the following question to us all. Since we know that Islam is such a peaceful religion. And let me make another point here. Orientalists, famous Orientalists have mentioned, for example, written in Islam, a book written by Islam, he says, the picture of the Muslim soldier advancing with a sword in one hand and the Quran in the other is false. He says, history makes it clear, De Lacy O'Leary in Islam and, and the Crossroads, Say history makes it clear, however, that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping through the world and forcing Islam at the point of a sword upon conquered races in, is one of the most fantastically absurd myths that historians have ever repeated. So the question we ask is why are they repeating? Where in the Quran does God say, go and kill the infidels, as some people perpetrate it to be? The messenger was suppressed for 13 years in Mecca, while he was a minority. Among the majority were idolaters. God did not allow him to lift a finger, though his companions were being killed. Where in Islam does God allow that? Nowhere. When he migrated to Medina, the enemies came after him and they attacked him and God commanded him now rise and defend. That's a God-given right to all of humanity. One needs not read the Quran to know that. Every civil nation has a defense fund. If you try to create an offense fund, you won't get any money because it's repulsive. So he was attacked. And he had to defend and defend and defend. So the historians took that as a means of spreading the religion of Islam with the sword. But the very name of the religion is peace. It's the only one in the world whose name means peace, submission. Isn't that a bit ironic? Isn't that a bit of a paradox? A religion whose name means peace is now marginalized in mass media as being the religion of terror. Isn't it funny, when David Koresh armed himself to his teeth in Waco, Texas, while reading the Bible cover to cover, that he was going to establish his principles on earth, in America especially, that he was never called a Christian terrorist. And rightfully so, he shouldn't be. Because Christianity is not a religion of terror. Judaism is not a religion of terror. If they were, they would not survive. But it is unfair when Muslims come forward in the garb of Islam, supposedly, where the media lenses picks them up. And then they're not only called Muslim terrorists, but now they have branded a new word, which is most unusual. They are called Islamists. <coughs> I've never heard an ist on any religion in the world today. There's no Christianist, there's no Judaist, there's no Hinduist, there's no... None of these, of course, besides Buddhist. <laughs> but of course, when we know we say it's Buddhist, we know they're gentle, loving, you know, uh, uh, subservient people, right? But the Islamists, oh, 
That was the extremeness. <laughs> but you have to latch on the word Islam before it, huh? So I always ask, why? When I was growing up as a child, the same thing. In my high school, junior high school, my teachers managed to tell me that the Muslim religion was spread with the sword. I always, you know, I remember in seventh grade, my professor, my teacher told me, yes, Islam is a, is a violent religion, you will spread with the sword. And as we say, this is ignorance, this is arrogance. But why is there such a consistent echo within certain, in certain parts of the world? And I raised my hand against the teacher and said, excuse me, I disagree with you. This is totally wrong. It's not possible. He said, oh yeah, historians have noted that. It was spread with the sword. That your prophet used to go, knock door to door, and tell people to become Muslims, or he'd cut their heads off. <laughs> I said, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, with due respect. I don't see a sword hanging over my head. And unless people are very masochistic, and they love to have swords hanging over their heads, why are people becoming Muslims? This notion is absurd. It is absurd. And it's a poison pill that gets planted. And my fear is, thank God, the majority of the world's population understand this is foolish. My fear is it takes only a few myopic visioned individuals who potentially may become leaders and stand on the pulpit and start wars in the name of God, and we've experienced those recently, where destruction and killing takes place in trying to counterbalance and marginalize a religion like Islam. Why? Why is that? I still, you know, as much as I'd like to pinpoint an answer to that, and there are many, I just feel that the Muslims have been marginalized for a very long time. You know, when we talk about people taking extreme measures to fight against people, the lenses pick them up. Let's just look at the problem. Who's invading who? Who's in whose land? Do you see Muslims today invading the Western lands? Do you see their militaries here? No. We have our militaries there. Then we bomb them like anything. When 9 11 took place, the list supposedly had mostly people from Saudi Arabia. What are we doing in Iraq? We're validating 9-11 by entering Afghanistan. Was there an Afghanistani in the list? So now if we're doing this, and killing, and yes, 3,000 innocent lives were taken in 9-11, and whoever has done that will receive their judgment on this earth and in the hereafter. That's the consolation God gives us that one who commits this kind of a heinous crime shall get it in this world and in the next, hands down. But why so many lives as a result after that had to be lost? And then when people defend their rights, the Islam comes forward, and we call them the ists and the Islamists. So we are constantly being marginalized even when we rise for our own rights. What's happening in Egypt today? What's happening in Libya today? All these uprisings that are taking place is because people are fed up of being used as pawns by nations that want to manipulate them and take their resources and enslave them. To God human rights, to human rights. I tell you, Bahrain. Notice how the media is so silent on Bahrain. Hmm? Bahrain. If a Jew is getting hit someplace, even in Africa, it is our God-given right to raise our voices for justice for that person, for those people. If a Christian is getting harmed anyway, it is our God-given right to rise and prevent any form of uh, oppression that takes place on any human being, regardless of race, color, religion. It is our God-given right. This is what religion is all about. Why is there silence in Bahrain? A majority population that follows the ways of Ahlul Bayt are being given the silent treatment while they're being shot head on with their faces and other nations have now driven in with their tankers to go and shoot the Muslims head on and the world is mum and silent about it. We talk about democracy. What kind of democracy do we want? 
Democracy should be where the constituent people of their own region should dictate their own destiny. But that's not how it works in the world today. Because then how do we take their resources without having to pay so much for it? Market value. So we find our Muslims are being marginalized. And then for us to come and defend Islam because it's not a religion of terror, I pose the question to our human race, who's taking whose rights? You know, when Germany was in Poland and the Jews were rising against the, you know, there were groups that were rising, Christians, Jews, Muslims, they were rising against this, uh, the German expansionism. We admired them. We called them the resistance, the ones that were fighting for justice against oppression of Hitler. We admire them. We should continue to admire them. We should look at the world through these lenses and then pose the question, why is Islam so marginalized? Final point I'd like to make. And with, I think this is a, 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 te a tactical problem. The atheists today use this argument that religion is the cause of all the wars. That's why we don't believe in God, they say. And sometimes we play to them by being irresponsible in how we present religion, true. So it's almost like there's this separation of religion from the rest of the human services. Like, for example, when we talk about politics, we say politics should be separated from religion. Islam has never introduced this idea that religion can be separated from any transaction. One who is in the service of God, 24 by 7, needs to keep in mind that every transaction, even when you're outside of your place of worship, needs to be followed within the prescriptions of God's law. So religion, people say, I, a person comes to me and says, you're, you're very religious, I'm not religious. I said, no, you are as religious as I am. He says, no, I'm an atheist. I said, okay, that's your religion. <laughs> You don't believe in God, you fight God when you want, that's your religion, that's okay, but that's your religion. Don't separate this terminology from me. Don't try to create like this some concocted, cooked up system called religion that us religious people want to bring into society that just is so impractical and unmanageable that it just is not going to work for us. I said, no, 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 no. Religion is a way of life. You can't escape it. And let's not fool ourselves into thinking somehow we need to bring God when we need Him and put Him away when we don't need Him. The way I see myself as a Muslim is as follows. Why I have no problem with religion regulating everything. I'm going to say, oh, hold on, Sharia law coming. Here, just don't talk about that. Oh my God, this is it. This is it. We're, we're going to be taken over by the world. You know, by these people. <laughs> I say, you know, as a scientist coming in the world of science, people say, you know, science and religion, they're irreconcilable. Evolution, problem. Creation, evolution. I say, it's a very simple answer. Evolution is a created system. And they look at you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's going to be the creation or evolution. I said, who dictated that? Who said that? You said that. The, the religion of God says, no. The whole universe is his creation. Therefore, evolution is part of the system, and therefore it's a created system. Admit it. Accept it. So the irreconcilability of religion to science is just a scheme of polemics. It's silly. I said even a scientist has to be regulated by a body of ethicists. Don't you agree? An ethical body controls a scientist. And therefore it is proof positive that philosophy and religion supersedes all scientific methodology. Islam is a universal system. It encompasses all. And therefore it is logical that the religion of God, whatever that is, when we search it, has to be universal. Has to allow diversity. It has to allow rejection of God. It has to allow promotion of God. It has to allow all forms of methodologies within its system. If it does not, it has failed the basic litmus test of being a universal religion, which is the only religion that can come from God, because God's religion is only universal. So Islam 
regulates that from the upper end. So now in the Western media said, oh, Egypt, oh yeah, the Muslim Brotherhood may come about. Okay, that's one group. Oh no, that's Islam. We can't have it. We can't have a government run by Muslims because the minute you have that, you're going to have extremism. These are all concoctions. Sure, we have extremist Muslims who are so myopic in their vision, they are an anathema to society. They create a burden on all of us. But that's not exclusive to Islam. You go to every faith, including Buddhists, who are non-theistic, they have myopic visions and extremisms. So why are the lenses being placed upon us? Even terrorist activities? You know if you go to the CIA statistics, the most terror takes place in non-Muslim countries. South America, for example, has the highest levels of terrorism that take place. Even in the United States, the terrorism that takes place is by non-Muslims, particularly drug trading and cartels and mafia cases. So, do we bring those out? No. We marginalize religion. What we're forgetting is even the fundamental Christian groups who are, for example, pointing a finger at the fundamental Jewish groups who are pointing a finger at Islam, or within Islam who are pointing a finger at Islam, they're doing a disservice to the whole system of religion by bringing atheists forward and saying to them, yes, we can manage ourselves, so you're right. And I think that's irresponsible. That's irresponsible. We've got atheists who are extremists, we've got all kinds. What I love about Islam is the following. The Quran addresses humanity Quran addresses believers, Quran addresses the troublemakers, Quran addresses the disbelievers, the Quran addresses the hypocrites. And if one understands the Quran, the worst human being is not a non-Muslim. The worst human being is a Muslim who doesn't practice and pretends to practice Islam, but in fact they're destroying Islam. What we call hypocrisy. The Quran addresses our Christian brethren, our Jewish brethren, humanity. When Allah says, Inna ladina amu, wal ladina hadu, wal nasar, wal sabi'in. Man amana billahi wal yawm al akhir. Wa amana salih, falam ajam inna rabbi wa la khawfun alayhim, wa la amana al-falum. What a beautiful verse. God says, Indeed, the believers and the Jews and the Christians and the savings. This is just a principle. It addresses all of humanity, but this is a template. The condition, look, you notice the first part of the verse is, indeed the believers, in the ladina, and the believers. It's including the believers who are the Muslims, provided, man amana billah, provided you believe in one God. Why? Because then your moral focus is directed properly. In, uh, uh, provided you believe in one God, believe in the day of judgment. Why? Because you're going to hold your moral prescriptions liable. There is a God who watches what you do. And therefore you better behave. Just like in a civil society, you have a judicial system. You misbehave, the judge sends you a subpoena and says, come, I want to pass a judgment on you. And then suddenly we start to behave. Because the impending threat, the pending threat that is, the pending threat that comes, which is the possible incarceration or possible fine, puts us in check. This is a perfect human system. If people say, God, why do you have religion? Because God is putting fear in you. I say, what's wrong with that? That's perfectly fine. We all need to, when we teach our children, don't do this or else, what's wrong with that? Should I not? Should I not regulate my affairs in the house with some fear, positive fear, positive fear, not negative, positive fear. So the Quran is saying, provided you believe in one God in the day of judgment. And you do good deeds. You promote good. Look at the operative word in the transaction of the religion of God, which incorporates the whole human race now, this verse. That provided you do good deeds. For you, don't worry. Do not worry. There is a good place waiting for you. Meaning God is consoling the human race and has addressed a select group of people to give them the standards, including the believers, that provided you have these principles, but the key is because when you promote good, 
you are always going to be within that description uh, of the uh, of being held liable morally. God says, don't worry. For you is a place of peace. So the universality of the religion of Islam is what gravitates me towards this religion and gives me this ability to come forward and say, we are Muslims, whether we are Christians or Jews, we're human beings at first. Our objective is to guide the human race forward and to be just and not to look at political scenarios like what is happening in Bahrain. It's a political spin because there's too much to lose if Bahrain falls in the hands of the local people. There is too much to lose in strategic relations. So that's turning a blind eye. When we turn a blind eye like this, then we're cherry picking justice. And that's not fair. I'd like to conclude that this accusation of Islam being the religion that was spread with a sword, you know, whenever I'm asked that question, I say to them, I'm a Muslim, and if you claim that my religion was spread with a sword, then you must admit that the Prophet promoted that, and God has commissioned the Muslims to spread the religion with a sword. And if that is the case, then God has to tell me how big the sword should be, how many sharp sides should it have, how many points should it have, and on who should I hit, where should I hit, how should I hit. Because at the end of the day, that's what religion is all about. <laughs> you know what's interesting? Even when I was interviewed on NBC and these other groups, I said, tell me, since you're interviewing me, how many times does the word sword appear in the Quran? And the interviewer says, I don't know. I said, please do your homework next time. <laughs> but I, will, I want you to take a wild guess. And she looked at me and said, zero? I said, bingo. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you think, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I said, how is it ironic? My religion is named Peace Submission. My entire scripture does not have the word sword in it. It has never allowed me to use it except in defense, and it doesn't even use the word sayyid, which is sword, in the entire Quran. This accusation is really a political spin against this religion that is touching the hearts of humanity. Otherwise, why am I being attacked? I'm not holding guns. I'm not bombing people. And if I am, it's because you're invading me. And when our women are covered with this guard, <clears throat> people say, that's oppression. I said, where did you associate oppression with covering? So when a woman goes outside and it's raining, you say, that's an oppressed woman. <laughs> <laughs> when it's cold, she covers herself. Oh, she's oppressed. <laughs> what an oppressed woman. Where do we associate these two? These are poison pill adages that have no correlation to humanity. Unfortunately, we take them thinking it's, it's the validated sentence. I was once in a temple, Jewish temple, and I was speaking, and I had a group of Muslim ladies who were dressed in the Egypt. In the Q&A she says, what is this you women are wearing? I said, you never watched the movie Moses? She said, I did. I said, did you ask the same question when you saw them wearing that? When you're on those streets and you see the the Christian nun dressing around, do you say, excuse me, what's this? You don't answer that question. I say, God's prescription is that the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims were all given the same. This is one rule, one law of God. We have maintained it. It's the prescription of God. There's nothing wrong with it. It's even in the Bible, the covering of the veil. So what is wrong with it? He looked back and said, oh, I apologize, you're right. I said, but it has been so politicized. Hence, it's become a symbol of negativity. Well, it's got a nobility status. It's got a status of uh, uh, modesty. I always say it's the flag of Islam. And maybe that's why they're so repulsed by it. I'm honored to be here this evening. The organizers who've done this, you know, bless you, Dr. Rizvi, the rest of the crew, my brother Mustafa Abedi, 
it's a blessing for us to commemorate, and especially when we bring people of other faith, our brethren, Christians, Jews, whoever, we all resonate because we all have commonalities. If you and I did an analysis of the commonalities that we possess between each other as a human race, it's in a 90% range. For example, God is so merciful between Muslim and Christians, Isa is the commonality, Jesus is the one. Between Muslims and Jews, Moses is the commonality. If you look at all different groups, God has never left us bereft of a bridge. And I always say that in order to be an expert in something, first you have to learn the commonality, the common, the basic, and then you specialize. Many of us are judgmental at the specialization level when we didn't even get our bachelor's degree. <laughs> this is where we're all fighting. If we want to discuss our differences, it's a healthy discussion, but it should come with maturity. Otherwise, we must learn to love and respect each other. As God says, Allah yuhibbul mu'asiti. God loves the peacemakers. So I conclude today, and I pray to God, that all these injustices taking place in the world today are uh, come to an end soon. And as we know, all of us, Judeo-Christian Islamic beliefs, believe in the Messianic principles, the principles of the coming of the Messiah. And as we know, in Islam, the Muslims categorically believe that the grandson of the Holy Prophet, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan, al ibn al-Hassan al hujjah as we know, is the one who is going to come and establish justice and equity in the world. What kind of justice? The Prophet said, when the time of my grandson comes, the believers in the East will see the believers in the West. Which is the technology today. Speaking about Twitter, speaking about Facebook, speaking about the technology we have uh, of like Skype. The Messenger said, the whole world will have heard about the Quran. Thank you, Terry Jones, for doing that. <laughs> the whole... <laughs> you know what's funny, Terry Jones was interviewed on BBC. Did you watch that interview? The guy on BBC is saying to him, have you read this book? He said, no. <laughs> Why don't you? But it's the devil's book. He said, how do you know? You haven't read it. But I just can't read it. Did you have a PhD? He said, yes. In what? I don't know. <laughs> so the guy in BBC is saying to him, you must be joking, right? He says, no, I'm serious. I mean, it's funny, but the amount of media frenzy and attention they got, I believe as a Muslim, this is God's plan. As we been mentioned beautifully. God says in the Quran, wa makaru, wa makaru Allah, wa khairu They plan, God plans. God is the best of planners. The messenger says, when my grandson comes, the whole world will be aware of Islam. You see today the Muslims in the world, they bow their faces on the ground. I admire that. I see Jesus, peace be upon him, he bowed his face on the ground. I see Moses, peace be upon him, he bowed his face on the ground. I see Abraham, I see him bowing his face on the ground. There are billions of people on earth today, if you look at them, the Muslims especially, are submitting to God. And it is upon us to be the good role models, to bring this justice and equity in the world. And we pray that all these dictators were falling like a bunch of cards. Hopefully we will establish justice and peace for humanity, that we can all coexist together as a human race in happiness. I would love to see our children thinking of higher existences rather than worrying about petty issues such as that we have today. May God bless us all. And God is most merciful and He is definitely worthy of remembrance. And I thank you all. Assalamu alaikum jami'am
Joyous emotional journey full of laughter, alone, and struggle. No press pass, no Arabic translator, real people, real life. At this time, I would like to invite Mr. Mubashi Hassan to the podium to speak briefly about the film.